Let's ultrasound. On today's edition of Small Parts Ultrasounds, let's explore a scrotal ultrasound homemade phantom. Do's and don'ts. So how did the homemade scrotal ultrasound phantom come about? We needed to find a way to simulate a scrotal ultrasound exam in the ultrasound scan lab with a group of general ultrasound students and determine which parts would work well for a homemade scrotal phantom ultrasound. We wanted to teach the scrotal ultrasound protocol tips and measurements and also be able to develop eye and hand coordination that comes with having to scan highly mobile structures such as eggs, to help simulate a real scrotal ultrasound exam. So first, let's talk about the components that worked well for a scrotal ultrasound homemade phantom. First of all, we used hard-boiled eggs for the testicles. We hard-boiled the eggs and peeled them and used two eggs per phantom. And the key to this was just ensuring that the eggs were not soft-boiled because they needed to be firm to withstand firm transducer pressure. Next, we used grapes as the epididymal heads. And we used green grapes, although you could use any color of grape. And you wanted to make sure that they're not too ripe. You want to pick the firm grapes that are not quite as ripe. And this is also so that they hold up longer with the ultrasound gel and also firm transducer compression. We also used Twizzlers licorice in order to simulate the epididymis body and tail. And the grapes were used to simulate the epididymis head. And we found that the Twizzlers licorice strips work better than red vines because the grooves on the outside of the Twizzlers were smaller and therefore easier to image. And we also used a Ziploc bag with gel in it. And this was to simulate the scrotal sac. So we used sandwich size Ziploc bags and we put quite a bit of gel within the bag as well as putting gel on the outside of the Ziploc bag. Now note that you can also use water. You can put a small amount of water within the Ziploc bag. However, the ultrasound phantom components deteriorated much faster when using water. Now let's talk about what made poor scrotal ultrasound phantom components. So first of all, when performing this lab, the most essential step is ensuring that your eggs are fully hard boiled. We had a couple of eggs from the bottom of the pan that ended up being only soft boiled. And those quickly deteriorated and did not make a good scrotal phantom ultrasound component and they pretty much disintegrated as soon as firm transducer pressure was applied. We also tried to use gummy bears to simulate the epididymis head, and the gummy bears were really too small and too compressible. In order to image them, we needed almost zero transducer pressure and a ton of gel, and it was exceedingly hard to see the gummy bear on the ultrasound image. And due to the challenge of visualizing this structure, there was no way to get it in the same image as the hard-boiled egg or the testicle. And we also tried to use gummy worms for the epididymis body and tail. And similar to gummy bears, these were too small and too compressible. And it was incredibly hard to distinguish them on the ultrasound image. They were located at the very top of the image, but it took a lot of trial and error to determine that. And then we also tried using just a paper towel with gel on the top of it for the scrotal sac instead of a Ziploc bag. And this did work better when imaging the gummy bears and the gummy worms and also the Twizzler. And so we placed those on a paper towel, laid them flat, and then put gel on top of them and were able to image them easier than we could image them within the Ziploc bag. However, this did mean that they couldn't be imaged in relationship to the egg or the testicle, which is what you would want to do in real life. You want to see the epididymis in relation to the testicle for comparison purposes. To prepare the scrotal ultrasound phantom, we used a sandwich Ziploc bag and we placed a large amount of ultrasound gel within the bag. And this was most commonly between two and six tablespoons of gel. And then we placed two hard boiled peeled eggs in the bag to simulate the bilateral testicles and then placed two grapes inside the bag to simulate the bilateral epididymal heads. And then we broke a Twizzler licorice stick in half 
half and placed both halves in the bag to simulate the bilateral epididymal body and tail. And then we placed additional ultrasound gel outside the Ziploc bag. And this worked fairly well. However, the components started to break down rather quickly. So rather than putting everything in the bag at the same time at the start of the lab, I suggest only put the right-sided structures in first and then do all your images and then put your left-sided structures in second, meaning the grape and the Twizzler. Both testicles or eggs should go into the bag right away. But the grapes and the Twizzlers broke down fairly quickly. So if you can hold off on the left epididymal head and the left epididymal body and tail and put those in the bag right when you're needing to image them, they won't have deteriorated while you're scanning the right-sided structures. Let's talk a little bit about image optimization for this scrotal ultrasound phantom. First of all, the hard boiled eggs were very dense. And so we needed to use the lowest frequency linear transducer. And we're generally around the nine megahertz range in order to try to penetrate through the eggs. And we truly actually needed to go lower than that, but our linear transducers didn't have capability to go lower without switching to a curvilinear transducer. And when we did switch to a curvilinear transducer, the resolution was much too low. So had we been able to, we really needed to probably be around five to seven megahertz frequency level for the ideal frequency level for the scrotal phantom. When you're imaging a traditional scrotal ultrasound, you always wanna use the highest frequency that allows you to penetrate down through the testicles. And so you may be able to use a much higher frequency than the scrotal ultrasound phantom allowed. We also stuck with a linear transducer for this scrotal ultrasound ultrasound phantom exercise to more closely resemble a traditional scrotal ultrasound exam in which linear transducers are used most of the time to perform the exam. Next, let's talk about gain. We had to use a really high level of gain due to the lack of penetration. And so we had to really crank the gain up in order to be able to visualize the borders of the egg all the way around. Now for a traditional scrotal ultrasound, you wanna set the gain so that the testicles are a medium gray color. And the gain should be set so that the epididymis is slightly hypoechoic to isoechoic compared to the testicles, as long as they're normal. For this simple simulated lab, the gain has got to be set up high enough so that you can clearly see the outer borders of the scrotal ultrasound components, whether that be the grape, the gummy bear, the egg, the Twizzler, or the gummy worm. And note that many of these components, such as the grape and the gummy bear, are going to be very dense structures, and they're going to produce strong posterior shadowing. Time to talk about depth. The depth should be set so that the bottom of the testicles or the eggs are located about three quarters of the way down the image. And for a traditional ultrasound when imaging the epididymis, the depth should be set so that the epididymal head is the star of the image and is centered in the image, both top to bottom and also side to side. For the simulated lab, the depth should be set so that the maximum amount of the epididymal body tail is visible. And note that if the depth is too shallow, it's gonna cut off the sides of the epididymis body and tail. And demonstrating the length of the epididymal body tail is more important than a shallower depth and having the epididymal body and tail more zoomed up on the image. Due to the lack of our ability to penetrate through the dense eggs for this lab, we really needed to increase the far field TGC to help compensate. And we also needed to increase the TGC when imaging the grape or the gummy bear as they were very dense structures. And the borders are very tough to visualize and they have strong posterior acoustic shadowing. For a traditional scrotal ultrasound, you wanna set the TGC so that there's equal brightness at all levels throughout the testicle and that the space above and below the testicles are hypoechoic but not anechoic on the image. And then for the epididymis, you wanna set the TGC so that there's equal brightness throughout that epididymis and that the tissue above and below the epididymis is not too bright or too dark. You should be able to distinguish the different tissue types above and below the epididymis and also the testicles. When imaging the scrotal phantom, as well as a traditional scrotal ultrasound, you generally wanna use two focal zones with the lowest foci placed at the bottom edge of the testicle or the epididymis. And then you can either use dual screen, 
to image the bilateral testicles side by side for comparison. A disadvantage to this method is that it takes just slightly longer to produce an image than the virtual convex method. Or you can also use virtual convex to display the testicles side by side for a comparison image. And virtual convex is a sector shaped field of view. Even though you're using a linear transducer with a rectangular field of view, there's a control on the ultrasound machine, which is called virtual convex, specifically on GE machines, that allows you to change the image shape to a sector shape and get more of the testicles within the image. Now, a disadvantage of using virtual convex is that only a portion of each testicle can be demonstrated within the sector field of view image, while when using dual screen, you can show both entire testicles. Time to talk about a typical scrotal ultrasound protocol. So you first want to take a comparison image, a transverse bilateral testicles with and without color Doppler. And you're looking to see, are the testicles the same size? Are they the same echogenicity? And do they have the same amount of blood flow bilaterally? And then you want to move to a transverse right testicle and you want to image this superior, mid and inferior. And for the mid portion, you want to take width and AP measurements. And then for the mid image, you also want to perform color and spectral Doppler images. And it's crucial that when you're doing the spectral Doppler images that you are not only interrogating the arteries, but also a vein. And then you wanna move on to a sagittal right testicle. And you want to image this laterally, a mid shot, and also medially. And for the middle portion, you want to take a length measurement and also a color Doppler image. And then it's time to move on to the epididymis. And you want to start with a transverse right epididymal head with and without width measurements and also with color Doppler. And it's crucial to compare the color Doppler signal of the epididymis with the testicle. So make your color box wide for this image so that you can compare the color flow signal between those two structures. And next you wanna turn into a long or sagittal plane to demonstrate the epididymal body and tail. And you wanna take AP measurements of the epididymis body and also the epididymis tail. So that's gonna be four measurements altogether for the epididymis. And then you also want to demonstrate the color Doppler of the epididymis body and tail and compare that with the blood flow pattern within the testicle. Next, move on to a sagittal lateral picture. And this is gonna be the space that's lateral to the scrotum. And this is where you would demonstrate if there's any hernias, varicoceles, etc. And then you want to repeat all of that for the left testicle. Here are some images of our scrotal ultrasound phantom demonstrating the bilateral testicles. And these are our hard boiled eggs. The image on the left shows the virtual convex. This is a sector field of view method of demonstrating the bilateral testicles. And the goal is that you want to demonstrate the testes side by side for comparison. And you can see with this technique, only a portion of each testicle is visible. On the right side of the screen, we use the dual screen control to demonstrate the bilateral testes. And for this, you can notice that both testes are visible in their entirety. Now, why do we compare? We compare to determine if the testicles are the same echogenicity bilaterally. Are they the same size bilaterally? Do they have the same echo texture? Meaning, are they homogenous or heterogeneous in echo texture? And then also, do they have the same amount of vascularity bilaterally? Now here's what a normal scrotal ultrasound would look like. The image on the top left demonstrates the virtual convex method of demonstrating both testicles side by side within that sector field of view shaped. And the upper right hand sided image demonstrates the bilateral testicular comparison using the dual screen control. Normal testicles on ultrasound are gonna be a medium gray echogenicity and they're going to have a homogenous even echo texture. They they should be relatively the same size and should have the same vascularity pattern bilaterally. Abnormal testicles are going to be hypoechoic, heterogeneous, smaller or larger than the other side, hyper or hypo or avascular blood flow compared to the other testicle. And they may also have free fluid around them and or display signs of skin thickening. 
Now let's talk about color Doppler and imaging the bilateral testicles. It's crucial to take a color Doppler image of both testicles side by side so that you can compare the vascularity pattern from one testicle to the other. The upper left hand image is a simulated color Doppler image using the scrotal phantoms. And we had our students practice this so that they can get in the habit of always evaluating the bilateral testicles with color Doppler. Even though eggs, when used as testicles, are obviously not going to have a color Doppler signal pattern within them. So what is a normal color Doppler signal in the testicle? You want to see small blips of color Doppler signal that demonstrates both arterial and venous flow bilaterally in the testicles. And you want both testicles to have the same amount of vascularity bilaterally. And you want to make sure that one side is not hypervascular, avascular or hypovascular compared to the other side. An abnormal color Doppler signal in the testicle is going to be hypervascular compared to the other side. It could also be hypovascular compared to the other side. It could be avascular compared to the other side. Or it may demonstrate arterial flow only with no venous signal or venous flow only with no arterial signal. Next up, we're moving on to the transverse testicle. And these images both demonstrate the scrotal ultrasound phantom. So these are our hard boiled eggs. And what I really liked about this scan lab that I think is really important for demonstrating real world conditions is that the bilateral eggs were highly mobile within that gel filled Ziploc bag. And so you really have to get the hang of using firm transducer pressure to get that egg to sit still enough that you can image it. And so this is an image demonstrating the transverse testicle and then also the measurements that should be taken for the transverse testicle, which are an AP measurement. This is the vertical measurement on the image and a width image. And this is the horizontal image on the screen. And then it's crucial to demonstrate the transverse testicle both inferiorly and superiorly to show that there's no pathology within that testicle. And the key to getting these images is to maintain firm transducer pressure while slightly angling the probe either superiorly or inferiorly. Now in a live patient, you have to be really careful that you're not hurting the patient while you're maintaining that firm transducer pressure. And most most of the time, you just want to ensure that your frequency is low enough to penetrate through the testicle and that also your far field TGC is increased enough within the testicle to be able to see that inferior border. However, when using eggs for this lab, the lowest frequency and the highest far field TGC were already being employed, which is why it's difficult to visualize the bottom borders of this simulated testicle. And it's also crucial to demonstrate color Doppler when imaging the trans transverse testicle. Time to move on to the sagittal testicle. And both of these images are using our scrotal phantom hard boiled eggs for our images. And there's two methods of imaging the sagittal or long testicle. The key is that the testicle is going to be a highly mobile structure. So you want to ensure that you're measuring what we call the longest lie of the testicle or the longest length that you can get. In the upper left hand image, the the longest length of the testicle happens to be exactly horizontal on the image. While in the upper right hand image, the longest lie of the testicle is a more oblique measurement. Either way, these are both correct measurements as long as the longest dimension or length of that testicle is being measured. And it's all dependent on how that testicle is lying within the body. The medial and lateral slices of the sagittal testicle should also be imaged. And you do this by applying firm transducer pressure to the midline of the testicle and then slightly angling your probe either medially or laterally. And when you're doing this sweep in real time, you just wanna ensure that you've looked through all of that testicle and there's nothing hiding along the edges of the testicle borders. And it's crucial that you be able to see all the way to the bottom of the testicle. You'll 
notice on these simulated egg testicles that the far field TGC is too dark and there's a lack of penetration. Now we were using the maximum amount of TGC in the far field and also the lowest frequency that was possible with our linear transducer so that we had no other way to improve this image rather than dropping down to a curvilinear transducer, which ended up being too grainy of an image for our purposes. However, when you're scanning a traditional scrotum exam, you wanna ensure that you have enough penetration and also your far field TGC is bright enough that you can see the bottom margins of that testicle so that you can accurately evaluate it for pathology. Now here's what a true sagittal and transverse testicle look like on an ultrasound. The normal sagittal testicle is going to be homogeneous in echo texture. It's going to have a medium gray echogenicity. It's going to be the longest length of the testicle with a smooth border and elongated shape. These are going to be oval shaped in this long or sagittal plane. And note that this is long or sagittal to the testicle itself and not the body. Because testicles are highly mobile, they can really lie in different positions within the scrotal sac. And then the normal transverse testicle is usually going to be more round in shape and also smaller than the sagittal plane. It's also going to be homogeneous in echo texture and have smooth borders with a medium gray echogenicity. Now let's look at normal versus abnormal color Doppler flow for a scrotal exam. The upper left-sided image is a normal color Doppler flow for a testicle, and you can see that it's demonstrating both arterial and venous flow. This is crucial for a normal testicle. The upper right-handed image is demonstrating hypervascularity within the testicle on color Doppler. And note that there's also arterial and venous flow present, which is normal. However, the amount of flow compared to the other side is significantly increased. And this most commonly occurs when infection or inflammation of the testicle is present. Now let's look at another representation of color Doppler flow for a scrotal ultrasound. The image on the upper left shows normal blood flow in the testicle with both arterial and venous flow present. And then the image on the upper right shows avascularity within the testicle. This is absence of both the arterial and the venous flow within the testicle. And this can occur when testicular torsion or twisting of the testicle is present. Time to look at spectral Doppler of the testicle. These two images demonstrate normal testicular spectral Doppler flow patterns for both arterial and venous flow. The image on the upper left shows a normal arterial flow pattern for the testicle, and this is going to be a low resistance pattern with flow sustained throughout diastole. And then the image on the right is demonstrating a normal venous flow pattern for the testicle. And note that it is crucial that both venous and arterial flow are present within normal testicular flow and you should demonstrate both of these with spectral Doppler for every scrotal ultrasound exam that you perform. And this is because when torsion is present of the testicle, this is a twisting of that testicle, blood flow is cut off and it can be intermittently cut off or when torsion is just beginning, sometimes only the venous flow is cut off and you can still have arterial flow present. And when venous flow is absent, this is one of the first signs that torsion may be present. Let's look at what an abnormal spectral Doppler waveform would look like for a scrotal ultrasound. A normal testicular spectral Doppler waveform is going to be low resistance, which means it's going to have sustained flow throughout diastole. With testicular torsion, the testicle is first going to lose its venous flow, and next it's going to have absent or intermittent arterial flow and or an abnormal arterial Doppler waveform. The waveform on the left is absent diastolic flow, and the waveform on the right is reverse diastolic flow. And these waveforms can occur with testicular torsion. For this next slide, we used a grape as a phantom for the epididymis head. And note how dense the grape is, and it produces strong posterior shadowing. And it was really challenging to image the grape and the egg, which represents the testicle, next to one another. For a normal scrotal ultrasound, you're gonna wanna decrease the depth in order to make the epididymal head the star of the image. And you should center that epididymal head within the image from top to bottom and side to side in the image. However, 
remember, this image was so hard to obtain because the grape is so small and everything is so mobile, the optimization was not performed. In the middle image are the measurements that you would want to take of the epididymal head. And this is a length measurement, which is horizontal, and an AP measurement, which is vertical. And then in the third image to the far left, color Doppler should always be applied to the epididymal head. And you want to use a wide color box because it's essential to compare how much flow is in the epididymis to how much flow is in the testicle. And for a normal epididymal head, it should have the same amount of flow as a testicle or slightly less flow than the testicle. What you don't want to see is absent flow, which is avascularity, or hypervascularity. We also tried to use a gummy bear to represent the epididymal head on an ultrasound. Note how dense this gummy bear is on the ultrasound. It displays strong posterior shadowing. Unfortunately, the gummy bear is so small and so compressible, it was really hard to image it and we had to use a lot of ultrasound gel. And we were unable, due to its small size and compressibility, to image this structure in comparison with the testicle, which is the normal image that you're gonna wanna take when when imaging the scrotum. You wanna have a comparison shot between the epididymal head and the testicle side by side to each other. These images show what a normal epididymal head will look like on an ultrasound. And the proper way to image this is opposite of what they've done in these images. You want to slide the epididymal head over so it's about a quarter of the way across the image so that there is empty space on the side of it. And then you should show just a portion of the testicle for comparison next to it. But you really wanna make that epididymal head the star of your image. And in this image, it's crammed so far into the side of the image that it's truly not the star. And you wanna adjust your depth so that you've centered that epididymal head side to side and top to bottom on the image. Plus, you also want to show a portion of the testicle so that the echogenicity of the testicle and the echogenicity of the epididymal head can be compared to each other, as well as the echo texture. The image on the right demonstrates the normal measurements that you would want to take of the epididymal head, and this is a length measurement, which is horizontal, and an AP measurement, which is vertical, on the ultrasound image. In a normal ultrasound, the epididymis is going to be isoechoic to hypo echoic in echogenicity compared to the testicle, and it's going to be homogeneous in echo texture just like the testicle is. Another crucial step is that the epididymal head should always be evaluated with color Doppler, and the color box should be big enough that both the testicle and the epididymal head color Doppler signal can be compared to one another on the ultrasound at the same time. Next up, we're moving back to our scrotal phantom. And for this section, we used a Twizzler licorice stick. And we did this to simulate the epididymis body and tail in the long plane. And this works better than a normal red vine licorice stick because it's got less pronounced grooves in it. And you can actually see on this ultrasound image the actual grooves of the Twizzler stick around the Twizzler rope, which I thought was pretty fascinating. The best way to get this image is to take the Twizzler out of the scrotal sac, which is the Ziploc bag, and place it on a paper towel, and then place a large glob of gel on the top of the Twizzler. And then with very light transducer pressure, keeping that gel between the transducer and the Twizzler, you will get this image, and you'll see that Twizzler on the top portion of the image. Now, I could have zoomed this up and made this Twizzler even more of the star of the image. However, if I had done that, I wouldn't have seen as much of the length of the Twizzler. And the length of that Twizzler, or in real life would be the epididymis body and tail, is crucial to see as much of it as you can. You don't want to zoom it up too much because you'll end up cutting off the sides of that Twizzler and showing less of its length. To measure this, you want to measure the AP dimension of both the body and the tail. And those measurements are demonstrated on the top right image. For the next scrotal ultrasound phantom component, we used a gummy worm to simulate the epididymis body and tail. And you'll note how challenging it is to see this on the ultrasound. And we really learned that the gummy worm is too small and too compressible to be used 
as a good phantom component. In order to see this, we had to take the gummy worm out of the scrotal sac, which was the Ziploc bag with gel, and we had to place it on a paper towel and place a huge amount of gel on top of it and then barely touch the transducer down until we could just get an image. And the gummy worm will be very superficial on the image. And then we went ahead and measured the body of the epididymis and the tail of the epididymis. And it's also crucial that you use color Doppler to evaluate the entire epididymis. And now moving on to an image of a real epididymis body and tail. This is the epididymis in the long plane. And note that this is long or sagittal to the epididymis itself, not necessarily to the body. And the normal epididymis body, head, and tail can all be seen together in that long plane. And the epididymis is going to be isoechoic to hypoechoic compared to the testicle, and it's going to be homogeneous in echogenicity. And the AP dimensions of the body and the tail should be measured, and this should be measured perpendicular to the wall of the epididymis. So perpendicular to its lie. It's also crucial that you evaluate the entire epididymis with color Doppler and that you also do this in the transverse plane when you're imaging the transverse epididymis head. The epididymis should have the same amount of blood flow as the testicle or slightly less blood flow than the testicle. It should not, however, be avascular or hypervascular and ensure that your color box is large enough that it demonstrates the entire epididymal length all the way from the head to the tail and that that is shown in comparison to the blood flow pattern of the testicle. Let's talk about some tips and tricks that are helpful when performing an ultrasound of a scrotal ultrasound phantom. Number one, work with a partner. It helps so much to have one person hold the phantom components still and the other scan the phantom. Now, in real life, you can't do this when performing a scrotal ultrasound, but when you're a student and first learning, you don't often have that hand coordination to be able to perform this lab on your own. Now, if you're experienced in sonography and have built up that hand coordination, it's much easier to perform this lab one-on-one without extra help. Also, tip number two is you want to use lots of gel. Do not skimp on the ultrasound gel. You want gel inside the Ziploc bag and also outside the Ziploc bag. And then moving on to tip three, you want to ensure that you're using firm transducer pressure on the eggs in order to penetrate all the way through the eggs. And it's really challenging to penetrate all the way to the bottom, even with the lowest frequency linear transducer setting. But when we tried the curvilinear transducer, it was too low of a frequency and did not provide high enough resolution. It's crucial to keep in mind that when you're performing a normal scrotal ultrasound, that you'll need transducer pressure that's firm enough in order to get diagnostic images, but not so firm that it's hurting the patient. Tip number four is to increase the far-field TGC and the gain to be able to see the egg borders as much as you can in spite of the lack of not enough penetration with the frequency. And then tip number five, you wanna use very light transducer pressure when you're imaging the grape and the Twizzler. These are the scrotal phantom ultrasound components to simulate the epididymal head, body, and tail. And my best advice is to take them outside of the Ziploc sac which is, represents the scrotal sac, and or if you keep them in the sac, place the grape or the Twizzler on top of the egg in order to visualize it better on the image. And then the last tip I have for you is to not be too hard on yourself. This is a challenging lab to perform, especially when you're first learning ultrasound. So take whatever images you can obtain. It's easy to lose these images when you stop to optimize the images. So this is the only type of lab or practice in the ultrasound lab where we encourage you to just get the best image you can get and not try your very best to optimize it. Because sometimes you've got to be getting these images really fast and you will lose the image if you spend too much time trying to optimize it. Now note that that's the opposite advice that I give for all other labs. All right, everyone, happy scrotal ultrasound phantom imaging.